Why were Mercury and Evinrude motors so fundamentally different when they're both trying to do the same thing? Push your boat through the water. You'd think after a century of competition, these two giants would have copied each other into oblivion. Here's what'll blow your mind. One company literally invented the outboard motor, while the other started as a propeller company that stumbled into greatness. Yet somehow they ended up building engines so different that mechanics can hear the differences from across the marina. The real kicker, the very things that made each brand successful might be exactly what killed one of them off. Yeah, you heard that right. One of these legendary brands is now nothing more than a museum piece, and the reason why might change how you think about your next motor purchase. Let me take you back to where this whole rivalry started, because the origin stories of these companies couldn't be more different if Hollywood had written them. Ole Evinrud was a Norwegian immigrant working in Milwaukee who had a simple problem. His girlfriend Bess wanted ice cream on a hot summer day in 1906. The ice cream parlor was on an island across the lake, and rowing there in the heat meant the ice cream would melt by the time he got back. So Ole did what any mechanically-minded boyfriend would do. He strapped a motor to his rowboat. Not only did he get the girl, they married in 1906, but he accidentally invented the entire outboard motor industry. Talk about killing two birds with one stone. Meanwhile, Karl Kiekhafer was a different breed entirely. This guy didn't stumble into anything. He was a perfectionist engineer who bought a failing engine company in Cedarburg, Wisconsin in 1939 for $25,000. The kicker, he didn't even want to make outboard motors initially. He was more interested in making magnetic separators for the dairy industry. But when he saw the shoddy engines the company was producing, his engineering pride kicked in. He couldn't let anything with his name on it be mediocre. Now, before I dive into the juicy technical differences that made these brands mortal enemies, make sure you hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Trust me, you're gonna wanna stick around for what I'm about to reveal about why your grandfather probably got into fistfights defending his choice of motor brand. This is where things get really interesting and slightly controversial. Evinrude built engines like Norwegian farmhouses, sturdy, practical, and designed to outlast your grandchildren. Mercury built engines like American muscle cars. Powerful, innovative, and designed to make your neighbors jealous. Evinrude's philosophy was simple, make it run forever. Their engines used heavier components, simpler designs, and what I like to call farmer-proof engineering. You could abuse an Evinrude, skip maintenance, run it on questionable gas, and it would still start on the third pole 20 years later. They used loop charge two strokes way longer than anyone else because, well, they just worked. Mercury. Karl Kiekhafer was obsessed with speed and innovation. He didn't care if his engines needed more maintenance, as long as they were the fastest thing on the water. Mercury introduced more new technologies in the 1950s and 60s than Evinrude did in their entire history. Direct fuel injection, Mercury. Integrated power trim, Mercury. Computer controlled ignition, you guessed it, Mercury. But let me tell you about Karl Kiekhafer's obsession with testing. This guy was certifiably insane about quality control. He once ran a Mercury outboard for 50,000 miles, equivalent to two trips around the Earth, just to see what would break first. He had test boats running 24-7 on Lake X in Florida, with drivers working in shifts. When something broke, he'd redesign it stronger. When that broke, he'd make it stronger still. Mercury engines from the 1960s were overbuilt because Carl literally tortured them into perfection. Meanwhile, Evinrude's testing philosophy was more like if it works for Sven's fishing boat in Minnesota for 20 years, it's good enough. And you know what? They weren't wrong. Their 9.9 and 15 horsepower engines from the 1970s and 80s became the AK-47s of the outboard world. Simple, reliable, and absolutely unstoppable. 
Commercial fishermen in developing countries still swear by these motors because you can fix them with a hammer and some bailing wire. Here's the controversial part that might ruffle some feathers. Evin Rood's reliability reputation was partly because they were scared to innovate. While Mercury was pioneering new technologies, Evin Rood was still perfecting designs from the 1960s. It's like comparing a Toyota Corolla to a Corvette. Both have their place, but they're playing completely different games. Let me hit you with some facts that'll make your head spin. In the 1970s, Mercury was putting electronic ignition systems in their motors while Evinrude was still using points and condensers. That's like Mercury using smartphones while Evinrude was still on rotary phones. But here's where it gets weird. Evinrude wasn't technologically incompetent. They invented the first commercially successful direct fuel injection system for two strokes with their ETEC technology. The problem? They introduced it about 15 years too late. By the time ETEC hit the market, Mercury had already moved on to four strokes and was dominating the high performance market. The development of ETEC is actually a fascinating story of missed opportunities. Evinrude acquired the technology from Ficht GmbH, a German company in the late 1990s. Ficht had developed a revolutionary direct injection system that could make two strokes as clean as four strokes. But the first generation was a disaster. Engines were failing left and right, and warranty claims nearly bankrupted OMC. It took Evinrude engineers years to perfect the technology, and by then, the market had moved on. What made ETEC special was its stratified combustion system. Instead of mixing fuel and air in the crankcase like traditional two strokes, ETEC injected fuel directly into the combustion chamber at 600 psi. This meant the fuel never touched the exhaust port, eliminating the classic two stroke problem of unburned fuel going straight out the exhaust. The result? 75% fewer emissions and 50% better fuel economy than old school two strokes. The real tragedy is that ETEC was actually brilliant technology. It delivered four stroke fuel economy with two stroke power to weight ratios. It was cleaner than most four strokes and required no break in period. But Evinrude had spent so many years playing it safe that consumers had already made up their minds. Mercury was for performance, Evinrude was for puttering around the lake. If you're enjoying this deep dive into outboard history, smash that like button and drop a comment about which motor brand your family swore by. I bet there are some heated debates in those comment sections. Now here's where the story takes more twists than a pretzel factory. The ownership history of these companies explains a lot about why they ended up so different. Mercury has been owned by Brunswick Corporation since 1961. Brunswick is like the Berkshire Hathaway of recreational products. They own everything from bowling alleys to boat brands. This gave Mercury incredible stability and deep pockets for R&D. When Mercury wanted to develop a new engine, Brunswick would write the check without blinking. Evin Rood's ownership history reads like a corporate soap opera. They merged with Johnson Motors in 1936 to form Outboard Marine Corporation, OMC. Then OMC got bought, sold, went bankrupt, got bought by Bombardier, who became BRP. And finally, well, I'll get to that heartbreaker in a minute. The constant ownership changes meant Evin Rood was always playing with house money. While Mercury was investing in long-term technology development, Evin Rood was trying to survive the next quarterly earnings report. It's hard to innovate when you don't know if your company will exist next year. Let me paint you a picture of just how different these philosophies were in practice. In the 1960s, Mercury dominated professional bass fishing so thoroughly that some tournament organizers considered banning them. Mercury's Tower of Power six-cylinder engines were putting out horsepower numbers that made Evinrude engineers weep into their coffee. The Mercury Tower of Power wasn't just a marketing name. It was a 2.0-liter inline-six that produced 150 horsepower when Evinrude's biggest motor was struggling to hit 100. But here's what the marketing department didn't tell you. These racing-derived engines were so highly strung that professional anglers carried spare powerheads in their trucks. It wasn't uncommon to blow an engine during a tournament, but when they ran, nothing could touch them. 
Mercury's race dominance wasn't an accident. Carl Kiekhafer personally led Mercury's racing team, and he approached it like a military operation. He'd show up to races with color-coordinated boats, motors, tow vehicles, and uniforms. His pit crews practiced like a NASCAR team. He even hired meteorologists to predict wind patterns on race day. Between 1955 and 1958, Mercury won so many races that other manufacturers threatened to pull out of competitive events entirely. But here's the flip side. Talk to any old-time marina mechanic, and they'll tell you stories about Evinrude engines that ran for 40 years on nothing but prayer and duct tape. There are Evinrude 9.9s from the 1970s, still pushing John boats around farm ponds today. Try finding a Mercury from that era that hasn't been rebuilt three times. I know a commercial fisherman in Louisiana who bought an Evinrude 25 horsepower in 1978. That motor has over 20,000 hours on it. That's the equivalent of driving a car 1.2 million miles. He's replaced the water pump impeller maybe a dozen times and the spark plugs every few years. That's it. The compression is still within 5% of factory spec. Try getting that kind of longevity from any modern engine, regardless of brand. The difference showed up in racing, too. Mercury won on Sunday and sold on Monday. Evinrude. Well, Evinrude owners were too busy fishing to care about racing. It's like the difference between a Lamborghini and a Land Cruiser. Both are vehicles, but they're built for completely different purposes. Now for the nerdy stuff that really separated these brands. Mercury pioneered the use of tuned exhaust systems that use the engine's own exhaust pulses to create a supercharging effect. It's basically free horsepower if you know what you're doing. Evinrude, they stuck with conventional exhaust for decades because it was simpler and more reliable. Let me explain how Mercury's tuned exhaust worked, because it's genuinely clever engineering. When a piston fires and pushes exhaust out of the cylinder, it creates a pressure wave that travels down the exhaust pipe. Mercury engineers figured out that if you made the exhaust pipe exactly the right length and shape, that pressure wave would bounce back at precisely the moment the exhaust port was closing. This created a ram effect that pushed extra fuel mixture into the cylinder, essentially free supercharging. The downside? Get the tuning wrong by even a few RPM and the engine would run like garbage. That's why Mercury motors had such peaky power bands. They were optimized for specific RPM ranges. Mercury also went all in on four-stroke technology earlier and harder than anyone else. Their Verado engines were technological marvels. Supercharged, intercooled, and smoother than a politician's promises. Evinrude stubbornly stuck with two strokes, convinced they could make them clean enough to meet emission standards. The Verado development story is worth telling. Mercury spent over $100 million developing this engine platform in the early 2000s. They didn't just want to make a four-stroke outboard, they wanted to make the Rolls-Royce of outboards. The supercharger alone was a masterpiece of engineering. Unlike automotive superchargers that use belt drives, Mercury's was gear-driven for absolute reliability. They even added an intercooler to cool the compressed air, something nobody had ever done on an outboard before. But Evinrude had their own tricks. Their ram injection system from the 1990s was genuinely innovative. It used the engine's crankcase pressure to inject fuel, eliminating the need for a separate fuel pump. It was simple, elegant, and worked great when it worked. The problem was that it required incredibly precise machining tolerances. If anything was slightly out of spec, the engine would run lean and melt pistons faster than ice cream in Phoenix. Evinrude Z-Tech engines actually had better fuel economy than many four-strokes in real-world conditions. The problem was perception. Consumers associated two strokes with smoke, noise, and pollution. It didn't matter that e tech engines were cleaner than your average lawnmower, the damage was done. And now for the gut punch. In May 2020, BRP announced they were discontinuing Evinrude Motors. Just like that, 111 years of history ended with a corporate press release. The company that invented the outboard motor was gone. The official reason was that they wanted to focus on their boat brands, but insiders know the real story. 
Evinrude had fallen too far behind in the four-stroke wars. While they were perfecting two-stroke technology that nobody wanted anymore, Mercury was selling four-strokes like hotcakes. It's like being the world's best typewriter manufacturer in the age of computers. The saddest part, Evinrude's final E-Tech G2 engines were actually incredible. They had more torque than equivalent four-strokes, better fuel economy than older two-strokes, and styling that looked like it came from a sci-fi movie. But it was too little, too late. The market had moved on. So what's the lesson in all this? Mercury's still here, stronger than ever, because they were willing to cannibalize their own technology to stay ahead. They didn't care about protecting their two-stroke business when four-strokes were clearly the future. They adapted, evolved, and survived. Evinrude died because they fell in love with their own engineering. They were so convinced that they could make two-strokes work that they missed the bigger picture. Consumers didn't care about elegant engineering solutions. They wanted quiet, clean, fuel-efficient motors, and Mercury gave them exactly that. For modern boaters, this history lesson matters. When you're choosing a motor today, you're not just buying horsepower and fuel economy, you're buying into a philosophy. Mercury's philosophy of constant innovation means you'll get cutting-edge technology, but you might be the guinea pig for new designs. Other manufacturers who picked up Evinrude's reliability-first approach might give you less exciting but more dependable options. Here's the beautiful irony. Evinrude might be dead, but their influence lives on. Every time you see a direct-injected two-stroke, yes, they still make them for snowmobiles and motorcycles. That's Evinrude's DNA. Every time a manufacturer chooses simplicity over complexity, that's the Evinrude way. And Mercury? They're still pushing boundaries. Their latest V12 600 horsepower Verado is so absurdly powerful that it makes their racing engines from the 1960s look like toys. Carl Kiekhafer would be proud, and probably already working on making it faster. The real winners in all this? Boaters. The competition between these two giants pushed the entire industry forward. We have cleaner, quieter, more powerful, and more efficient engines because Mercury and Evinrud spent a century trying to one-up each other. The story of Mercury and Evinrude isn't just about two motor companies. It's about two fundamentally different approaches to solving the same problem. It's about innovation versus tradition, performance versus reliability, and ultimately, adaptation versus extinction. Next time you're at the marina and you see someone firing up their motor, take a second to appreciate the century of rivalry that made that moment possible. Whether it's wearing Mercury Black or Evin Rude Blue, on an older boat, of course, that engine carries the DNA of two visionaries who changed boating forever. And remember, in the end, Mercury didn't win because they made better motors. They won because they were willing to destroy their own success to build something better. That's a lesson that goes way beyond boating. If this deep dive into outboard history got your props spinning, then ring that notification bell so you don't miss my next video. Until next time, keep your props in the water and your engines running smooth.